We are still in the book of Hebrews. Um, we're in Hebrews uh, chapter 3 today. We're going to be uh, looking at the entire chapter. Uh, if you have been with us, uh, we've been journeying through this book. And, and really, the writer of Hebrews, uh, what he's been doing is, is putting before us the fact that Jesus is superior to all things, uh, that he is uh, supreme. He is uh, the one who is above all things, that he is better than everything. Uh, He's been layering that uh, verse after verse after verse, and then we saw last week what he did is he he changed gears a little bit and and went, okay, look, I know I'm I'm telling you the whole time that I want you to see Jesus as fully God, as the one who is sovereign over all things, Uh, and at the same time, I also want you to see that he is fully man. Uh, And and, and in his humanity, he he identifies himself with us, Uh, and it's just such a beautiful thing to think about. Like the the beautiful truth of the fact that Jesus came and took on flesh so that he might live the life that we should have lived, died the death that we all deserve. And it's in that identifying that we find our salvation, the fact that Jesus is fully God, so he's able to drink the cup of wrath and then fully man to understand our humanity and our limitations, our struggles and our pain, but to not sin. That's what separated him from any man. And so the writer of Hebrews has just been putting this before us over and over and over again. And so in verse 1 of chapter 3, he goes, therefore, well, that therefore is in light of everything that he's told us, yeah. right? That therefore is, is going, listen, everything that I've said about who Jesus is, and then last week when we looked at the fact that he's fully man as well. So therefore, holy brothers and sisters, I love that introduction. Holy brothers and sisters, that if you've crossed the line of faith, that if you look to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are declared holy. Now, I know this is something that we don't necessarily think about because we don't always feel holy. But, But your feelings here have got nothing to do with it. If God declares something, then he's declared it. It is what he says it is. And so the writer of Hebrews recognizes that because we are now identified with Jesus. He goes, okay, now you are now holy brothers and sisters. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in a heavenly calling. Everything that we do must come from God. Everything that you do must be shaped by this heavenly calling. Now, I I say this in a room of people who are doing some of the most incredible things in the world, but hear me, if it is not shaped by this heavenly calling, then it's not really going to amount to anything. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession. You see, Jesus here is referred to by the titles of apostle and high priest. And this occurs only in the book of Hebrews. Apostle once, and then high priest about 12 times. And these titles are used with great intention. See, Jesus was and is the apostle, the sent one. That's what it means to be an apostle, that the sent one. He was the original sent one, better than all the others. See, Jesus repeatedly describes himself more than 10 times in the gospel according to John as being sent by the Father into the world. He is the sent one. Jesus is the first apostle. Jesus is the great apostle. He is the source of all apostleship. His apostleship is prior to all other apostleships and is the foundation of all. See, all of them were were following Jesus because he was the sent one. We're also told that he is the high priest. That's the other title that it's given. And now we've spoken at length about what it means that Jesus, for Jesus to be the high priest. But but let me, uh, in short, in summary, quickly remind you. You see, Jesus was perfectly human and perfectly divine. He knows what it means to be both fully man and fully God. Therefore, he is able to speak to humanity for God and to intercede to God for humanity. He is the only one through whom we can come to God. 
and God to us. Yeah. He is Emmanuel. God with us. That's, that's what it means for him to be the high priest, that he's the mediator. He's the one that stands in the gap between humanity and God. And so the writer of Hebrews goes, I, I want you to see Jesus as the apostle and the high priest. See, after understanding this, only after understanding this and recognizing it, can we be prepared for the full force of the command that we receive? See, see, it's it's only when we see Jesus as the apostle, the sent one, and the high priest, the one who stands in the gap, then we can actually understand this command, which is to consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. The New Living Translation says it this way. Think carefully about this Jesus. The NIV says it this way, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Jesus is that important. And so consider him. R. Kent Hughes says this on the matter. He says, fix your thoughts expresses attention and continuous observation and regard. It means to apply one's mind diligently to fix one's attention in such a way that the significance of the thing is learned. How does one fix one's mind? It begins with desire. Along with desire, fixing the mind calls for concentration. Concentration, of course, requires discipline. Discipline, I want you to think of an athlete or or, or one who's doing research for their master's or PhD degree, of which I know many of you know about. And then lastly, fixing our thoughts on Jesus requires time. Desire, concentration, discipline, time. Desire, concentration, discipline, time. And so as you consider Jesus, my question to you is, how are you doing in those areas? Mm. Are your desires for someone or something else? Do you show up to a Sunday gathering like this and and there's zero concentration? Your mind is everywhere except on focusing on Jesus. I mean, we could talk about discipline. Like, are you reading God's word? Are you in prayer? Are you plugged into community? What about time? Is is Jesus getting your leftovers? Or is he getting your everything? Desire, concentration, discipline, time. Fix your eyes on him. Consider Jesus. Having been challenged to fix our eyes on Jesus, the ultimate apostle and the ultimate high priest, the the, the writer of Hebrews begins to now explicitly address something quite crazy, especially for them back then, right? So, So once he's established that, he's like, okay, Jesus, high priest, the apostle, consider him. Then he goes, okay, now, having done that, I want you to see that Jesus is better than Moses. Now, this may be difficult for us today because we are unfamiliar with Jewish history and and so we don't necessarily appreciate the, the, the incredible respect and admiration that was given to Moses and in fact even still today given to Moses by the Jewish community see many of us we we go oh Moses we think uh, Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston um, when you believe you guys know that song (laughs) right we think that cartoon and like baby Jesus and and, uh, beautiful movie beautiful movie but but that's what we think but for the Jewish community they're going yeah Moses Moses they had incredible respect and admiration for him I mean, so much, so much could be said about Moses. M- Moses is said to be one of the, the, the greatest of all Hebrews. And we've got to understand that, to, to feel the weight of what the writer of Hebrews is about to tell us, we've got to recognize how significant Moses was. And, and so in summary, let me, 
Let me give you a few of those things, hoping to, to show you how, how big of a deal Moses was. Number one, Moses was divinely chosen for his grand task. He was divinely chosen. Everything that was happening, the fact that like, what was going on at that time, and they had to place him in a basket and kind of run down the river. Like, it, it's insane to think all those things culminating to his divine calling. He was divinely chosen for a grand task. Second, Moses became this unique deliverer of his people through un, an unmatched display of power. Yeah. Un, unmatched yeah. display of power. And, I mean, most of us know the story. Like he, he showed up to Pharaoh and, 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 and did all these, these, these amazing and incredible things. And then on top of that, like when, when Pharaoh was like, no, I'm not going to let the Hebrews go. He's like, okay, you sure about that? unmatched display of power. And so the people looked to Moses and were like, the incredible leader. Generation after generation, the stories that were told. Here's a third one. Moses served as Israel's greatest prophet. He he just did. God communicated to other prophets indirectly through various means, but he communicated directly to Moses as God himself. We read about this in, in Numbers 12. Let me, let me read you a few verses. Then the Lord descended in the pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam, he called, and they stepped forward. You see, Aaron and Miriam, uh, Moses' brother and sister, like they were pushing back on, on, on what Moses was saying. Like, why you, Moses? Why you? You were living in the palace not too long ago. Why you? And so God goes, hold on. Aaron, Miriam, hold on. And the Lord said to them, now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. Of all my house, he is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? The greatest prophet Israel's ever had. Number four, Moses was the lawgiver. Right? He was the lawgiver. He he wrote the first five books of the Bible and it's just law after law after law. Like, what are we supposed to do? Ask Moses. How do we handle the situation? Ask Moses. Respect and admiration for this man. Number five, Moses was Israel's great historian. But the reason that we know the history of the, of the Israelites is, is because of Moses. He penned it. He, he wrote it down. Number six, Moses was a very humble man, more so than anyone on the face of the earth. The Bible actually tells us that. The most humble man. Six reasons why they respect and admire Moses. But you know what? Let me add one more. Make it seven, right? Seven is the perfect number. Moses married Zipporah. A, 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 a sun-kissed African woman from the land of Cush. That counts, right? That, like, that counts. So, 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 so seven reasons why people would have respected Moses. And so with that said... Hebrews 3 points our attention to the fact that even though Moses was a big deal, Jesus is bigger. Like, like I, I, want you, I want you to be a fly on the wall as this, this, this letter's been written to uh, the, the, the Hebrews then. And, and they're going, could you read that again? Like the way we love Moses... And, and respect Moses. You, you're saying Jesus, like Jesus is better. The writer of Hebrews is not just saying it, he's yelling it. Jesus is superior. Yeah. He is superior to Moses. But how, how? How is this possible? I'm glad you asked this morning. Well, I could give you so many reasons. Let me give you two. Right? And this is how we're going to navigate through the text. Two reasons that clearly show us from God's word that Jesus is superior to Moses. 
We've already seen that he's superior to the angels. It's like, the, listen, the writer of Hebrews is literally just going down the list. He's like, you guys were all in wonder of the angels? Okay, here, here, here's how Jesus is better. Boom. So, so naturally you go, okay, fine, he's better than the angel. Fine, okay. But Moses, ah, huh? Moses. He goes, okay, let me show you. Let me show you why Jesus is better than Moses. Reason number one, Jesus is superior to Moses because Jesus served as a son over God's house while Moses was a servant in God's house. Let me read it to you. Hebrews 3 verse 2 says, He was faithful to the one who appointed him just as Moses was in all God's household. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder has more honor than the house. Now, every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was faithful as a servant in God's household, as a testimony to what would be said in the future. But Christ was faithful as a son over his household. See, it is, it is more important for us to follow the king who has authority over God's people yeah. than to follow the servant who operates among God's people. Yes. That's the point that he's making. He's like, I, I know you guys are eating all of this up. Everything that Moses has written, beautiful, we should. But just make sure, just make sure that you are following the king, the one who is over the household. It is more important to follow Jesus than to listen to Moses. Again, they would have heard that and gone, wait, what? We have studied Moses' words over and over and over again. We, We know them by heart. And you're saying, no, no, no. It is more important to follow Jesus than to listen to Moses. And that's true because in us listening to Moses, we are being pointed to Jesus. And as we're being pointed to Jesus, we're listening and following everything that he tells us. But if our listening to Moses does not take us to Jesus, then we are in error. And we should tread carefully. You begin to treat this like an academic textbook. Moses is not the end. He is pointing us to the end. I mean, Jesus tells us himself. In John chapter 5, verse 39 to 40, he says this, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive life. So the whole time, they're just like, how can we know this? Where does it fit? It? And, and there's value in knowing God's word. Yeah. But it must point you to Jesus. Jesus says this after his death and resurrection in Luke chapter 24 verse 44. He says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with, still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He's just going, guys, it's, it's all pointing to me. Jesus is saying it's all about me. And he's the only person that can say that. I know there's many of us, we, we get in environments where we flex a little bit. And we go, you know, it's, it's about me. I am the most important person in the room. Without me, they will do nothing. No, no, no. No. Th- that is only for Jesus. It's all about him. And so he tells us that Jesus is superior to Moses. And after saying that, he he then says in the rest of verse 6 of Hebrews 3, and we are that household if we hold on to our confidence and the hope in which we boast. This household that Jesus is over, like like we are that household. You and I, those who've crossed the line of faith, those who've gone before us, those who are with us, and those who will come after us. We are that household that Jesus is over. And then the call here is to faithfully persevere. And we'll come across this again and again and again in the book of Hebrews. This idea of continuing until the end, holding on, for this is the test of real faith. The call to persevere. Now, the Holy Spirit then jumps in here, all right? He jumps in here and and he asks, are you persevering? Or... 
in the bumping waves of life do you find yourself drifting? Are you persevering or are you drifting? Is Christ as beautiful and amazing as the first day you surrendered your life to him? Is there an ever deepening love for him? Are you holding on to your confidence? Which is boldness that is willing to embark on any danger or any activity that Jesus calls you to. It's that level of confidence. You are so anchored in Jesus that you're like, you know what, whatever he tells me to do, I'll do it. Whatever he says, I'll do it. The the, the posture of our lives should be like the the servants at at that first miracle where where Jesus' mother says, you know what, whatever he says, do it. And I, and I want us to pause here for a moment because I think some, we, we read way too quickly and this just becomes normal. You're at a wedding. The wine runs out. That's a, that's a big deal. Like it's massively embarrassing. And so Jesus' mom recognizes this, goes to Jesus and says, you know, hey, I, I need you to fix this. I love his response, but we won't get into it right now. But, but she says, fix this. And then doesn't wait for him to like turns to the servants and goes, whatever he says, do it. Jesus then says, okay, fill these jars here. These jars were used for for washing hands and like it was was the the water that was used to to, to cleanse after eating. And and so he says, fill those jars, those nasty jars, fill those jars with water. And And then go and then kind of serve the people. Now, can you, can you imagine that for a moment, if you're a servant? Like, you're going, like, you're talking amongst each other, like, man, this is ridiculous. Like, what, like, like we're gonna, now we're going to go serve, and, like, people are going to look at us and be like, why are you serving me water from this jar? And, and, but they do it, and they go, and they, they serve. Most of us know how the story ends. The water turns to wine. In fact, not just any wine, but incredible wine, the best wine. That's a massive risk to take. Don't just read this. That is a massive risk to take. And yet, that is the call of being a Christian. That's the confidence here that we are to have. Whatever he tells us to do, to do. You know, let me take it further. I know many of us in here are praying for a miracle. For something. I don't know what it is. It's a job. It's health. I I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but you're praying for a miracle. You're praying for someone to to, to come back. One of your kids has has wandered away. They've drifted. You're praying for a miracle. Provision. You're praying for it. But, But maybe, just maybe, that miracle is on the other side of that step of obedience. Just maybe. Just maybe. And so what is... Jesus calling you to do right now? Is there a conversation that you need to have with someone? Is there a message that you need to send? Is there an area that you need to step in and serve and commit to? That miracle that you're praying for might just be on the other side of that step of obedience. And my hope is that you would take it in confidence. Are you holding on to the hope in which we boast? That is, are you so satisfied in the gospel that nothing else will do? Was was there a time in your life, perhaps, with the fresh glow of new faith, when you were bold and courageous for Christ, but now with the passing of time, your boast and your courage are gone? If so, God, God's word says that you must hold on. Hold on. Focus on. Hold on to Christ, our great superior apostle and high priest. Hold on. F- friends, this, this, this is why Jesus matters. Because while I'm telling you to hold on, the reality is that he's holding on to you. It's us recognizing that first, the recognizing that he is holding on to us and he will never let us go. And so we, we shouldn't fear anything. Fear is not a feeling. I say this often. Fear is a spirit. 
And we have not been given a spirit of fear, but one of love, power, and self-control. And so whatever I'm going through, I can just go, you know what, Jesus, you're holding on to me. Things feel chaotic at the moment, but you're holding on to me. People are lying about me, but you're holding on to me. I, I don't have what I need, but you're holding on to me. And so because of that truth, I can hold on. Moses can't do that for you. Because he himself needed to hold on. And so what he's doing is he's holding on and writing, hey guys, listen, you need to hold on. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. I'm holding on. Hold on. Reason number two, why Jesus is superior to Moses from the text. It's because Jesus was and continues to be so important to God's plan for our lives. That rejecting or neglecting Jesus is more serious than rejecting or neglecting Moses. And so what the writer of Hebrews then does is he he takes us back to a time when this happened. And, And so read with me from verse seven. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked to anger with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that... There won't be in any of you an an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage each other daily while it is still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who heard and rebelled? Wasn't it all who came out of Egypt under Moses? With whom was God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Now, now there's, there's a lot going on here. But for the sake of time, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to summarize it. I'm going to summarize it by telling you a story. I'm going to tell you the events of Exodus. See, the Exodus of God's people out of Egypt to the promised land began so well. With great expectation. See, at midnight, on that unforgettable night, all the Hebrews were snug and secure in their homes. With the pleasing aroma of roast lamb hanging protectively over them. The destroyer struck down all the firstborns of Egypt, both man and beast. And grief, a grief-stricken cry rose from every Egyptian house after Egyptian house. This was the mark of the end of more than 400 years of slavery. Pharaoh called for Moses, commanded the Hebrews to leave. So they go. 600,000 men on foot, plus women and children. So about 1.5 to 2 million people. And all their livestock, they all began the exodus. It was a proud departure. They were probably singing the song that we just sang, or at least a song like it, right? The one we just sang, la, 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 no, okay. Just me. Each tribe headed by its leaders. And then the most amazing thing happened. As they entered the wilderness, an enormous pillar of cloud formed in the sky before them to lead the way. At nighttime, it became a pillar of fire so that every night Israel was illuminated by its bright burning glow. What a marvel that must have been to see that against the backdrop of the star-scattered desert sky. Then, of course, there was the disastrous pursuit of Pharaoh. 
that trapped Israel between a rock and a hard place, between Pharaoh and his army and the Red Sea. But God, huh? but God, he came through for them. Moses stretched out his hand and an east wind began to grow, driving a, a dry path through the sea for the people of Israel to walk along. It provided safety for them. God parted the Red Sea, allowing them to cross and just at the right time, closed up the sea. And that was the end of Pharaoh and his army. God was with them. What do they do? They burst into song. They respond in song. With tambourines and dancing, they sang a new song to God. Let me give you a portion of it. Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and its rider into the sea. Man, we should be writing songs like this. We made it through COVID. We made it through the pandemic. We made it through depression. I, I, like, sing a new song. Like, that's their response to what God did. They sang their faces off. Awe and wonder gripped the people. They sang in honor and admiration to God. What an incredible beginning. Can you imagine that? After more than 400 years of slavery, now you're free. Soon, they would be in the promised land. And they would forever enter their rest. It all began so well. But we all know the story. It ended so poorly. I mean, of the millions of people who left, only two over the age of 20 ever got to the promised land. And that was 40 years later. Uh, think about that. Like, what? like we, we started off so well. And then we found ourselves in the wilderness for 40 years. The disappointment. See, the grand and terrible lesson of Israel's history is that it is possible to begin well and end poorly. Yeah. It is possible to begin well and end poorly. Mm -hmm. The Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness after rejecting and neglecting God's commands. The, the, this is why the writer of Hebrews says, in Hebrews 3, verse 12, he says, watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. See, the, the hardening of hearts haunts the writer of Hebrews. Because you, he knows that it's a reality. It haunts him. His worry is that the fate of the generation of the Exodus will be repeated by them. My fear is that it will be repeated by us. See, many of our spiritual exoduses have been beautiful. Literally, we could, we could, one after the other, we could spend the whole day sharing story after story after story of what God did. Here's where I was going, but God. Story after story after story. But the question is, when hardships come, when trials come, when challenges come, what do you do? What do you do? How will you finish? We won't finish well if we do the same thing that they did. He tells us that we're to protect our hearts. See, the, the rebels in Moses' day missed out on the promised blessing of entry into the earthly promised land. But hear me, rebellion against Christ forfeits the even greater blessing of eternal life. That's the comparison that the writer of Hebrews is doing. He's going, guys, listen, yeah. you all know how bad it was for them. We know the history. But if you reject and neglect Jesus, what you miss out on is eternal life. See, un unbelief is a dangerous thing. Unbelief is not inability to understand. Let me make that clear. That's not unbelief. But it's unwilling, 
an unwillingness to trust. Unbelief is, is not the inability to understand. There's a ton of things that I don't understand. A ton. There's tons of things that I don't understand that God does. He, he spoke everything into existence. God, you know what I would have done? I actually would have written it down, like literally everything that happens as it's happening, so that when people read it, it makes sense to them. That's what I would have done. But you know what? God didn't ask for my opinion. So now I'm left with, like, you just, like, you just spoke. And then we have everything, like everything. The things that we are trying to understand through maths and science and discovery, like you just went, universe. There's a ton of things I don't understand. The, the, the very gospel itself that you, you sent your son, who, who did absolutely nothing. He was perfect. And you sent him to come in and to die for us imperfect, sinful people. I don't get it. You know, I, got, I wouldn't have done it like that. You know? But he didn't ask for my opinion. There are tons of things that I don't understand. Jesus is fully man and fully God. I, I, can't, like, I can't even wrap my, 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 my head around that. But I can still believe. Friends, unbelief is not the inability to understand. There's tons of things we don't understand. Unbelief is when we are not willing to trust. You can believe God and still be occasionally troubled by doubts. And Jesus is not afraid of your doubt. So stop pretending and performing. Because that's what we do. Like, like, we don't want people to think, like, you have doubts. But only you show up here every Sunday, you get up, you preach. How can you have doubts? I have doubts. But Jesus is not afraid of my doubts. Here's the thing. Where are you taking your doubts? Because if it's not to Jesus, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble. There is a doubt that wants God's promise, that still wants God's promise, but recognizes that, you know what, I'm, I'm weak in faith. I'm weak in faith at the moment. Unbelief isn't weakness of faith. Unbelief sets itself in opposition to faith. It it sets itself in opposition to faith, to reject God's word. And friends, this is serious stuff. This kind of unbelief is serious stuff. And, And this is why... This is one of the many beautiful reasons that God places us in community. There is a protection of heart that is needed, but you need to place that heart in community. We need one another. This is why the writer of Hebrews goes on to say this in verse 13, but encourage each other daily while it is still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ. All of us. If you've crossed the line of faith, we've become participants in Christ. If we hold firmly until the end. But we're called to encourage one another. The writer exhorts us to encourage one another. Think how different it might have been for Israel if they had daily encouraged one another instead of complaining and grumbling. Because that's what happened. After more than 400 years of slavery, you hit a little challenge, and all of a sudden you're like, you know what, this sucks. Mm. Moses, why would you bring us out here? Well, what was the alternative? Oh, we remember the days when we used to sit in slavery, but we had our pots of stew. Like, are you serious? Like, 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 is that literally coming out of your mouth? Grumbling and complaining are dangerous to the body of Christ. The opposite is to encourage one another. It's to encourage one another daily. Because if, if we grumble and complain and grumble and complain and grumble and complain, it is a slippery slope. And if you let your heart continue down that path, it does not end well for you. It didn't end well for them. Isolation, and particularly isolation from 
the mutual encouragement of the body, it's a dangerous thing. Friends, even Paul, even Paul, Paul the apostle, Paul, like, like you know the, the way the Jewish community looks to, to Moses? That's how, let's be honest, that's how we look to Paul the apostle. Incre- what, a, what a man. What a church planter, what a pastor, what a preacher, what a leader. But even Paul himself goes, guys, I can't live in isolation. I also need mutual encouragement. He, he, he says this in Romans 1. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Oh, that's the Paul that we know. Bring, bring that, that, that wisdom so that we might be strengthened. Yes, Paul. And then he says, that is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. He's asking churches that he started to go, guys, I, I need you. You need me. We need to mutually encourage one another. We are to encourage one another every day, not just on Sunday from 9.15 to 11-ish. Yeah, it's going to definitely be an 11-ish morning. <laughs> like, th- that's, that's what most of us do. It's like, I, I can't wait for Sunday because I'm going to be mutually encouraged just in that slot. It tells us daily. Daily. So what does it look like to be mutually encouraged daily? Well, it means to be plugged into community. Get into community. And, and, and I, guys, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get church hurt. I, 100%. It's real. There are some horrible things that are happening out there. 100%. But you know what? Jesus can heal those. In fact, Jesus loves to heal those. The question is, are you willing to be healed? Sometimes we get so comfortable with our hurt that we begin to identify ourselves by it. That even the thought of it being taken away feels like that's a part of my identity. Jesus wants to heal you. He does. And, and, and one of the ways that he beautifully does that is he plugs you into a healthy community. Not perfect. None of us are. If you're looking for the perfect church, good, like, good luck. And, and, and you might leave here and go, you know, at this place, I'm going to go to this church. You know when that church is going to like, end up in a really bad, well, it's when you show up. Because you, because you haven't taken time to heal. So what are you going to go do there? Let's be honest. What are you going to go do there? It's, it's like you're, you're, you're bouncing from, from boyfriend or girlfriend like, to the next one. Like you're just, and you're not taking time to go, you know what, actually, Jesus, I need to be healed. I'm not okay. I have doubt. Great. Let's talk about it. I've got concerns. Great. Let's talk about it. I've got pain. Great. Jesus is just going, great. Let's, like I already know. He already knows. You can hide from us, but you can't hide from Jesus. We need to encourage one another daily. We need one another. Especially those of us who are struggling. And you know what? That's all of us. Today, brother. Today, sister. Listen to his voice. So that you may not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness making tomorrow's repentance and faith even more difficult. Yeah, sure. Because that's what happens when the heart becomes hard. It's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and you get further and further and further, and it just becomes so much harder. Not impossible, but so much harder. Yeah. Listen to his voice, and, 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 and his voice comes through his word, comes through being prayed for, being encouraged, being reminded that you're not alone. Beautifully designed for fellowship. Sin is not your friend. Some of us have entered into a buddy-buddy with sin. And I know we'll never say that. So we'll say things like this. It's not that bad. Or, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Like, that, that, that is language to say, you know, sin and I have entered into something. Oh, no, don't worry, it's not that bad. I'm, I'm in control. I can, no, I can manage this. Sin is not your friend. Sin is deceitful. Yeah. 
from the very beginning, much of the power of sin lies in its deception. Sin is deceitful in the way that it comes to us. Sin is deceitful in what it promises to us. Sin is deceitful in what it calls itself. It never shows up as, I'm here to wreck your life. Right? Like, it it just doesn't. There's no knock on the door to go, you know what? I'm about to turn your world upside down. Can we fellowship? Never. It's always like, you know what? Hey, let me me help you out here. You know, like, if you just take a little bit off the top, like, who's good? I mean, you earned it. Right? Like, they they don't deserve you. That's how sin shows up. Sin is deceitful in the excuses it makes. Sin will take you further than you want to go, will make you stay longer than you want to stay, and will always make you pay more than you can afford. Every single time. This is why Jesus says that the thief comes only. If you hear nothing else, hear the word only. To tear your world apart. So we need one another. That when the drift happens for someone to go, hey, where are you going? To to, to say, hey, you know what? I haven't seen you around in a while. Where you been? No, no, it's private. It's private and confidential. I get it. Your relationship with Jesus is a personal one. But it's not a private one. It's not a private one. It's a personal relationship, but it's not a private one. It's communal. And if you believe that it's a private one, then you have an incomplete understanding of the gospel. It will take you further than you want to go, make you stay longer than you want to stay, and make you pay more than you can afford. I'm going to call the band up and, and, and wrap up. The writer of Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, Today, that's Sunday, today, today, the 2nd of April, 2023, today, if you hear his voice, and, and my hope is that you have. I know some of us are going, I'm, I'm listening, wait, shh, waiting for the heavens. He's been speaking over and over and over. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Just real quick, at first glance, you might think that the key to entering rest is obedience. That's what I thought when I first read this, especially from Hebrews 3.18, which says, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed, right? So we go, oof, disobedience. And then you go, like, it should get super scary because you go, but I'm disobedient. I'm just being honest. Like, I'm disobedient. Like, like, there are tons of things that Jesus says I should do, and I'm going, oof. She says, hold on, let me first sort out my calendar and then I'll come. I'm disobedient. So then I go, so does that mean, what what does that mean for me? No, hold on. But the disobedience mentioned in Hebrews 3.18 is a result. It is a product of the unbelief that is mentioned in Hebrews 3.19. Which says, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Friends, we disobey all the time. We are sinful human beings. But we believe. The difference is we believe. We believe so much that we come to the Father and we say, you know what, I've wrecked it again. But your blood still works. I've messed up again, but your blood still works. I know that I was here last week Sunday saying, you know what, Mm, great mess, I'm not going to do that again. And by Tuesday, I was already swimming in my sin. But we have belief that he continues to forgive, that he continues to love. We are told that those who are in his hands can never be removed. So today, if you hear his voice, if you hear him saying to you, I love you more than you could ever imagine, I'm pleading with you to listen to me. Because if you follow me, you will find life and life to the full. Do not neglect my commandments. 
But if you mess up, don't listen to the father of lies who says that you're done. That you can never go back to the father. In fact, the father can never look at you. That's not true. Because when the father looks at you, he first sees his son Jesus and then he sees you. That's the beauty of our identity in Christ. And so today, if you hear his voice, if you're that person going, you know what, I, I, I'm tired. Like, I, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm like, I just, I don't want to do this anymore because I know. Like, I've, have you ever felt so gripped by sin that you just go, you know what, I'm giving up because I don't think God can help me? That's a lie from the devil. God can and God wants to. The question is, do you believe? What are the things in your life right now that you need to look to God and say, I, I want to believe? Is it your marriage? Your kids? Some of you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. And you're praying for them. Every time you want to talk about the things of God, they just, they, they shut you out and you, you, you're just, you, you're, you're burdened. Continue to believe. Do not harden your heart. There's a lot of things I don't understand, but I'm choosing to believe. And when I'm limping, I need to plug myself back into this community. And go, friends, brothers and sisters, I need you to pray for me. Like Sunday after Sunday, this, this, place, this, this place should be littered with folks that's going, you know what? I need you. Jesus, I need you again. Now I get it. Some of you are on the mountaintop and praise Jesus for the mountaintop. Man, I, I, want you, I, I guess I want you up front here singing your faces off to Jesus, thankful for all that he has done because you're just like, this is beautiful so that we can see that God is still good. Don't be on the mountaintop and like, you know, this is just for me, you know. My life is good. Like, no, like, mutual encouragement. So praise Jesus for your mountaintop. But you, I've lived long enough to know life this side of heaven is not only mountaintop. There are some valleys. And some of you are there right now. Today, if you hear his voice, I'm pleading with you. Just like the writer of Hebrews was pleading with them. What God has in store for you is more amazing and more beautiful than you could ever imagine. And my hope is that you would not harden your heart. So much so that you miss out on what he has for you. In the New Testament context, our belief centers on the superiority of Jesus Christ. The truth of who he is, fully God and fully man. And he's atoning work for us as the faithful high priest. When we trust in these things, making them food for our souls, we enter into God's rest. So I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for all of you that you would be able to enter into his rest even now in this moment. We're going to talk about it in a couple of weeks where Jesus, Jesus is, is, is greater than the Sabbath day because he is our rest. All right, so that's a little preview, but I, I want to tell you now that, that you can enter into his rest right now. You, you're wrestling with a lot. And your, your mind is everywhere. You're, you're, you're stressed. You're anxious the uncertainty of tomorrow. You can find your peace and rest with Jesus right now. And so heads bowed, eyes closed. Father God, I pray that you would meet us where we are right now in this very moment, that we would take time. I know we're always finding ourselves rushing to things. And even in this, in this week as we look back to... Uh, Jesus, where you started on Palm Sunday and heading to the cross, like even in that, there was no rush. We find ourselves full of anxiety, 
stressed out, burnt out. We're frustrated with the world. We're frustrated with ourselves. I pray for every single person here that they would believe. Believe. Believe that you are who you say you are. You're the good shepherd. The one who's willing to leave the 99 for the one. And so in this place, there are many ones. You're coming after them. I pray for every single person here who knows that they're not a Christian. They know they haven't crossed the line of faith. Maybe they've been around a lot of Christian things. They've been to church and they've been to community groups. And, but deep down they know that they haven't surrendered their lives to you. I pray that today that they would hear your voice. But let it all go. That we're not the masters of our own destinies. We're not in control. You are. And so we give our lives to you, not just pieces of our lives. We don't just give pockets of our lives to you. We give everything to you. And so God, if there's a person in here who has not surrendered their lives to Jesus, I want them to know that all they have to do is say, God, I, I need you to save me. Save me. And that is a prayer that you answer 100% every single time. And then, God, would you plug them into community where they will be encouraged daily. And then, God, I pray for those who have crossed the line of faith but have drifted. We found ourselves grumbling and complaining. Why is my life this way? Why have things not gone the way that I want to? Why am I experiencing this? But I pray that they would consider you, Jesus. They would fix their eyes on you. And so God, now as we, as we sing, as we respond to the gospel, Lord, I, I just, I pray that it would be more than just words on a screen, but that there would be a real self-evaluation of heart. Where are we? Where are we in light of our relationship with you? All of us are in desperate need of a savior. His name is Jesus. And so we give you the praise. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.